In 2017, I gathered a beautiful team to help me, and we put a beautiful conference on at the Medla Center. Then we did another one in 2019, and this past winter, we did a retreat in Mexico called Be Like Water. And I've met so many women who are on this path, and I always wondered, like, why don't we become masters? Why aren't we motivated toward mastery? We are motivated towards healing. I mean, all this healing work that's done in the world right now with Tai Chi and Qigong, most of the teachers are women. We're all here. A lot of us do this work. It's very important work. I'm not saying that it's not. But there are all kinds of things behind a woman's journey through the Tao. And I just want to say that Taoism contains an important tradition of female mastery that is inherent in its philosophy as well as its practices. Women, we represent the cosmic force of yin as men manifest and represent the yang counterpart. Of course, we all have both. But together, we create a whole to keep the balance. The other thing to remember is, if you are at all involved in the Taoist alchemical practices, the deeper meditations, the work with the internal energy, the Taoists also saw the female body as a unique vehicle for spiritual understanding and alchemical transformation. And some even thought that women had more possibility of attaining immortality, which was the first step to return to the Tao. And this caused enlightened women to be seen, not as ordinary humans, but as supernatural beings who were holders of shamanic powers and healing abilities, as well as aspects of celestial power who could reveal the secrets of the Tao to the lucky mortals among us. And you know, in the old text, when you read even about Qigong masters, they say that Qigong masters have extraordinary powers. Well, we've seen through this conference what those extraordinary powers are. You know, if you practice, you do develop a higher level of health and physical mastery, which anyone who practices could develop. It's not just the masters who can do it. If you're an ordinary person, you practice and you develop a certain level of mastery over yourself. So I'm just so pleased to be able to have this panel of amazing uh, and accomplished women who practice and who serve our art because it is an art. And this presentation that you're about to see is gonna be very different from every other presentation you've seen here. And I say, yay! <laughs> <laughs> so I wanna first um, just say an important thing that we all need to remember. That actually, we are all sitting here because of the work of these women who brought Tai Chi to the West. You see on the left, Gerda Geddes, who was the first person to study Tai Chi and taught Tai Chi in the UK. She brought it there. Sophia Delza did the first public demonstration of Tai Chi at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City in 1954. She had the first English language book on Tai Chi uh, which was called Tai Chi Chuan, Body and Mind in Harmony. And that was published in 1961. So we want to honor these women who, in some ways, brought us all here. And we need to remember that women can be masters. They can activate 
the chi flow. So I'm going to turn this over now to my dear friend and Tai Chi sister, Violet Lee, who is an amazing practitioner and a journalist. She's written thousands of articles about Tai Chi. She did incredible work during the pandemic. She's a 12th generation Chen style inheritor, an indoor disciple of Grandmaster Chen Zheng Li, and she's an amazing person, and we love her. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I'm Violet Lee, and uh, with this hair color, you can call me Copper Lee. <laughs> okay, uh, first let's see where we have been or where they have been. And um, as you know, China is a very old, old country uh, with a written history at least 5,000 years. And uh, China, China is, you know, is also a very, very large country with lots and lots of people. <laughs> and um, there are a, a few uh, ethnic uh, groups. And the largest one is so-called the Han people. And uh, the Han people is the very first one who settled down and developed agriculture. And, uh, and you know, once you um, settle down, right? and uh, you can develop a lot of technology in construction, in medicine, and then in all kinds of uh, areas. And then, but it also means you want orders, you want stability in your society, so you can continue to flourish. And uh, one of the Chinese philosophers, and Confucius, I guess you all know who he is, right? And then Confucius is very big on so-called li jiao, uh, the ritual, and then to define the relationship among people in the family, in society, or in the nation. And so, and uh, once in a very agriculture uh, economy, so like I said, rules and of uh, rules and responsibility was established. So. Girls should be obedient. Girls uh, learn domestic uh, crafts and not martial art. And uh, many of you know that um, Tai Chi Chuan is a healing art, but as well as a martial art. And the girls should not play with boys after age of seven. Of course, it depends on which part of China they're from, and uh, maybe a little bit different from region to region. But it, in general, you know, girls and boys kind of being separated after the age of seven. And another thing about the so-called family secrecy, and that should be shared within the family, not with outsiders. And many arts, like medicine, and then as well as martial art, and uh, there are a lot of secrecy. Why? There are some with good reasons, because, uh, for example, and uh, like a martial art, and uh, there's one is called Dian Mai, and uh, you, you put uh, some you know pressure on somebody's pressure points. We, we heard a lot of, uh, in these two days, right? Pressure points, and then you can immobilize the person. So if I passing uh, this kind of knowledge to anyone, and uh, a school years one, and then they can do harm to others, to society. So that there's a good reason, uh, you know, to keep that secrecy and um, and the same with medicine and, and so forth. So and girls normally after they they marry, they belong to the husband's family. They are guests in their own home. So mm -hmm. as I just mentioned, uh, and you don't want to share the secrecy outside the family. That's why. Uh, girls were not taught uh, uh, martial arts or Tai Chi Chuan. So that's the reason. And uh, historically, and uh, you know, there were a few women 
be mentioned, and uh, some of the names you're probably familiar with, Mulan, right? The Disney movie Mulan, and uh, uh, Hua, Family Hua, and Mu Guiyin, and these being worshipped, and uh, and uh, throughout the history, and there were uh, stories, uh, um, shows, or uh, operas, you know, and uh, be made after these people and these ladies. But uh, unfortunately, there were not any official and uh, documents and uh, on them. But there are still a few, like the Fu uh, Hao, uh, and uh, she was uh, about uh, 1600 um, BCE, and the, the prince. Um, Pinyang, Pinyang Gongzu, and uh, Liang Hongyu, and uh, Qin Liangyu, and uh, also uh, uh, Yang. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, you guys can't read that. <laughs> and uh, so they were uh, being, uh, how should I say, documented historically. But there's one thing. Uh, different about these ladies. As I mentioned, uh, you know, Chinese, uh, there are several uh, different ethnic groups, and uh, the Han uh, people, and um, they are, you know, more on the richer side and uh, more reserved. And uh, some of the, these um, females I just mentioned, and uh, they actually belong to so called uh, the minority ethnic group. So the, the, the culture were much different. And now let's look at the 20th century and, uh, and um, uh, Sharon mentioned about Sophia Deza and uh, her book covers here. And, uh, and then Sun Jianyun, and uh, she is a lineage of, uh, and the daughter of uh, the Sun Star Tai Chi. And, uh, and uh, here's a, a picture of uh, she and her father, when she was a young girl, and then, and you know, Sharon also mentioned about uh, Gladys, and uh, she she's a uh, uh, Norwegian <coughs> and uh, study in Tai Chi in China and later on Hong Kong and brought Tai Chi to the uh, UK, and Wang Jirong, and uh, she's uh, um, famous and um, in China and in Shanghai. And uh, Gan Gan Wei Xiang uh, is your teacher, right? And uh, <coughs> Paul, Dr. Paul is a teacher. And uh, Lily Lau, and uh, she is an uh, eagle car. And um, she's uh, also a uh, daughter of Grandmaster uh, Lau, and uh, she's in California. And the uh, uh, Bossy Mark, and locally in <laughs> Boston, you all know that. And uh, she, she is a uh, Dominion's mother. And then uh, here are our favorite magazines. <laughs> of course, they all see uh, printing, and uh, some of them you can find online. And um, do you see any ladies on the cover? <laughs> and there may be one uh, somewhere there, but oh, I think it was covered here, but you got a picture. <laughs> OK. And so. Now let's talk about uh, the current state and the um, first one, uh, the Universal Healing Down. And uh, that was founded by Grandmaster Man Chian and uh, in 1983 and one of the, the I would say, uh, so-called the first modern organization certified instructors. And uh, they have uh, certified 878 individuals in the U.S. for Tai Chi Qigong and the iron shirt, <laughs> believe it or not, and Dao Yi, and uh, 222 are women. And, um, and interestingly, you know, 43% of uh, those certified, uh, actually, they do uh, iron shirt. The National Qigong Institute, and a nonprofit organization founded in 1997, um, and then uh, in their database have uh, 1,400 uh, instructors and uh, in the U.S. and 40% men and 60% ladies. And the uh, World Tai Chi Day and Qigong Day Association and uh, again, a nonprofit organization. Of course, they don't really uh, um, mark who is an instructor who's not, 
but uh, they have information about the uh, organizers for the events and um, in the U.S. and um, and uh, there are 115 uh, females and uh, 99 male and then 100 and uh, because they don't ask you for your gender so they cannot be identified. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Tai Chi Healthway and um, was founded by my Tai Chi brother, uh, Master Jesse Chow. And um, so, and uh, for his organization, because he does more uh, traditional Tai Chi, and 50% uh, were men or army, and uh, two are uh, female, and um, stranger. Okay, and the uh, National Qigong Association, and um, it's founded in 1996, and they have 181 enlisted instructor, 55% men, 45 women. And um, IIQTC, and uh, founded by Dr. Yanka, and I know many of you, and, uh, and certified with him, and uh, it's a great organization. And they, they certify people on uh, modified Tai Chi and Qigong exercise, and this is 2001. And um, they have 33% men and 60% uh, female. And Tai Chi for Health, and uh, founded by Dr. Uh, Paul Lan here, and uh, they're probably the largest one of 1,600 certified instructors. And I was told about 60 to 70% uh, women, right? Or oh, higher? Okay. And then uh, regarding ship network, and uh, they, they have been uh, um, a great uh, 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 promoting the healing art, and uh, they have um, hosted uh, a few of uh, this uh, global uh, <coughs> summit regarding Qigong. And uh, thank you to Sharon. <laughs> and with her effort, she was trying to bring as many uh, uh, qualified female and uh, masters and uh, expert, and uh, so, but uh, still, and fifty-six percent. Were men and 44% were female instructors. And uh, lastly, just a very s <coughs> small uh, example is in St. Louis, which I used to live, and I collect a, a small um, no, database. 54% uh, were men and 33. Oh, sorry. Altogether, 54 people and uh, 33 are men and 21 women. So, what's the conclusion? And um, so this was a very difficult task because there is not a national database whatsoever. And all the, the, um, the organization I just mentioned, they have different uh, standard, different ways of, uh, you know, count uh, their members and so forth. But overall, we found out that more men are certified for traditional uh, tai Chi and Qigong, and the more women are certified for simplified Tai Chi and Qigong. And uh, I want to make a, a qualification for that. Uh, it doesn't mean say, you know, if you practice simplified uh, Tai Chi or Qigong, it's less, okay? It's just different type of uh, uh, practices. And uh, there is no single certification uh, standard adopted by all organizations, and I think that, that was one of the, the topic that we had for that. And uh, so, um, again, you know, uh, there's no um, a national database for that, and uh, a lot of times when we look at a database, and there's no uh, gender, um, you know, assignment there, so we don't really know exactly. But uh, uh, what I have uh, collect for you, hopefully just uh, a, a, a picture, a rough picture. But uh, uh, anecdotally, and uh, we feel there are more and more women and uh, uh, now uh, teaching. And uh, of course, uh, some of the organizations, they have told me, even though they certify a lot of people, but many of them, they don't practice, especially many of the females, they don't practice uh, teaching. I why they don't practice, I don't think they don't do it itself, but they don't teach. Okay, well, thank you. I guess my time is up. We're <laughs> here now from Ruth Taylor Pillai. Many of you know her. She's gonna bring the science and research to us. It turns out that 
looking at gender in the research community, especially around the uh, benefits of Tai Chi and Qigong for women, is just something that's starting to happen. So, Ruth. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, just to clarify, I'm the PhD program director, not the head of the school, so that's okay. <laughs> I don't want you to get the wrong idea. <laughs> um, so, why is gender or sex, depending on which term you use, important to consider in research studies? So actually, we all know that it influences health and disease. You know, men and women are different, we're not the same. Um, and it also helps us to inform the development of different strategies to prevent uh, disease occurring. It helps with treatments and, and the like. And the National Institute of Health, that's actually now their policy that when we conduct research, we need to report and, and analyze our data according to sex, right? They define sex as the gender you're assigned at birth, okay? I know there's a lot of different ones out there now. So that's what we're gonna use for our definition. So we need to do this in our research designs and when we do the analysis of our research studies, and it's supposed to be reported in all studies um, that are conducted with people. You probably are all familiar with this, um, the leading causes of death in women. Um, this is from 2023, so most people think the leading cause of death in women is breast cancer, guess what, surprise, it's heart disease. So over 60 million women are impacted with heart disease. It accounts for one out of every five deaths in women. It's the, the leading risk factor is high blood pressure. And African American women have higher rates of death due to heart disease than any other ethnicity group. But cancer is number two. Um, it affects women of all ages and races and populations. Um, surprisingly, African American women have the highest rates of death from cancer, um, but there are differences according to ethnicity. American Indian and the Alaska Native women have higher um, rates of kidney cancer, and then the API, or Asian Pacific Islander women, have higher rates of liver cancer. Stroke is the third leading cause of death in women, but overall, I think it's now number five, or maybe, yeah, number five, I think. So um, so it affects in one in every five women between 55 and 75. Again, the leading risk factor for stroke is high blood pressure. So something we need to think about. And African-American women have the highest rates of death due to stroke. Lower, uh, chronic lower respiratory disease is a fourth leading cause of death in women. Um, so it includes a lots of different diseases like asthma, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, as well as lung cancer. Um, the leading risk factor, smoking. Um, more women die from COPD than men. Surprise, huh? Mm -hmm. And more women are diagnosed with chronic bronchitis than men. Mm -hmm. Wonder what that's all about. Um, and then Alzheimer disease is the number five cause of death. And um, it affects over five million um, women who are 65, at least 65. Um, wait, it affects over five million people and two thirds of the people are women. Bibliometric analyses take all the research that's been done on a topic and pool it together, right? They don't do the mathematical things, they're just like counting numbers. And so if we look at the top 10 conditions that were reported, um, they found for Tai Chi, it was hypertension, COPD, diabetes, knee osteoarthritis, um, heart failure, depression, and the list goes on, right? And for Qigong, the top ones are diabetes, COPD, hypertension, stroke, and then also some back issues. There was no data on whether it was different for men and women. When I did look to see what studies had been conducted in the last five years using Tai Chi and Qigong in women, um, the most common, so I found a total of 10 studies, they were, and I looked at clinical trials, right? Clinical trials, 
usually you have a comparison group, like people who do Tai Chi, people who do something different. Um, so there were studies that were specific to women um, that looked at fall prevention or fear of falling, migraines, breast cancer, bone mineral de density, low back pain and physical function. Okay, And then if we look at Qigong, there was breast cancer, emotional exhaustion, physical and cognitive function, mental health and sleep quality, um, female genital self-image and sexual function, as well as intimate partner violence. But not a lot of studies on each topic, but that's all that I could find in the last five years. When we look at the Tai Chi studies, when we look at like fall prevention, the, that area, you know, it was older women, um, but they did find significant results, better physical function, less back pain, better balanced strength and gait. Um, when they looked at, when the study, amongst women with migraines, they were on average 49 years old. Um, they had fewer migraines per month after being involved in a Tai Chi intervention. And then um, the studies on breast cancer, um, these were a little bit younger women, around 48, and um, they reported less fatigue, sleep disturbance, and compared to controls. Um, and then the study that was done amongst perimenopausal women, um, they reported increased bone mineral density compared to controls. Now, if we look at the Tai Chi studies, or the Qigong studies, um, amongst nurses, and they were even younger, they reported less emotional exhaustion compared to at baseline. Um, then um, we had a study of Qigong amongst sedentary women, those were actually college students, and they reported better aerobic capacity, which is they could exercise better compared to their counterparts. Um, looking at postmenopausal women, they reported uh, better sleep quality, less anxiety and depression compared to controls. And then um, the study that was, uh, another study that was done amongst this group of people was better female genital self-image um, and sexual function compared to control. Then and the study amongst intimate partner violence, um, less sleep disturbance. So, um, and then of course the two, studies or articles I found on breast cancer, they were meta-analyses, and they found better quality of life and less anxiety and depression compared to controls. So that's what the literature showed us, looking just at women, right? But here's, here's the interesting thing. So remember, we I presented a few minutes ago, what are the top 10 um, conditions um, that have been studied? Um, looking at Tai Chi, and of all the studies, the top 10 conditions, nothing has been reported that's looked at um, with sex and gender specific results. And in the Qigong studies, um, maybe the insomnia a little bit uh, was reported because they did look at sleep quality in one study. And then also breast cancer, of course, was study. So not much to date has been reported. Looking specifically how are men and women different in some of these. And then if we go back to the top um, reasons for leading causes of death in women, uh, we can see, <laughs> you know, that we're not meeting our targets. We're not helping women to reduce their risk of their mortality risk if we're not reporting these um, differences by sex gender. Um, so that's something for us to think about going forward, either for Tai Chi and Qigong. Um, maybe with Qigong we're doing a little bit better by looking at breast cancer, but there's, you know, if we look at the leading causes of death in women, we really need to be focused more in reporting that. Um, some ex unexplored topics that could be done amongst women would be looking at acute trauma, different types, maybe chronic trauma or complex trauma. Thank you, Sharon. It's an honor to be part of this panel on the topic of women in Tai Chi. 
My name is Josie Weaver, and between the years of 2016 and 2021, I served as president of the nonprofit named Healer Within Foundation, an organization dedicated to educating the public about mind-body practice, especially Tai Chi and Qigong, through training, educational events, practice groups, and participation in research. I have just a few slides to share to illustrate some telling data points about the work of the Healer Within Foundation concerning the topic of women in Tai Chi. The numbers are telling. Along the way, uh, as I show you these slides, I also share a few observations as a teacher of the arts and an observer of the trends in the culture and society at large. So with this first slide, I want to show you some interesting data about who visits the Healer Within Foundation website to get information on the topics of mind-body arts and Tai Chi. You will notice here the pie chart on the right that shows an almost but not quite 50-50 split when it comes to men and women who visit the site to get information, find out more. The good news here is that the topic of mind-body practice and wellness appeals to the sexes equally. This data, by the way, shows the traffic roughly from six months of 2023, this year. People coming to the Healer Within Foundation website are most likely interested in some kind of education and training about the arts. Healer Within Foundation in particular focuses on training and leading people in what may be termed simplified forms of Tai Chi and Qigong. The idea here is a focus on health and wellness and inviting people of all abilities and backgrounds to practice. On the next slide, I want to show you who it is that seeks this kind of training. You will notice that it is women who seek this kind of training. Take a moment to consider and wonder about that. The practice leader training is a brief entry level training of 25 hours that has been accepted as meeting and exceeding the minimal professional requirements to lead practice as established by the National Expert Meeting of 2005. In 2005, a diverse group of experts got together to determine a course of bringing practice to greater numbers of people. This diverse group of experts included scientists, research, as well as students and practitioners. This is not unlike the diverse population that has come to Boston to this conference on the topic of science of Tai Chi as whole person health. The important thing back in 2005 was to remove barriers to practice and to empower ordinary people to lead practice and improve their health circumstances. The determination was to encourage the dissemination of simplified practice and also to encourage people to seek more education and to adopt practice long term. The Healer Within Foundation codified the requirements and adopted a 25 hour training to provide to the public. This is what appeals to women a short training that's comprehensive but based on principles and rendered by the founders of. Healer Within Foundation, Dr. Roger Yanka and his wife, Rebecca McLean. Their vision is to bring practice to as many people as possible, a vision that includes people suffering from health and economic inequities, social inequities. The vision is that simplified practice can be done with not a lot of resources. So between the years 2016 and 2021, when I served as president, the organization trained a 1,000 practice leaders, and I share this number to give you a sense of proportion of the women who trained versus the men. I'm happy to report that the majority of trainees were women. Roughly, the percentages are 70% women, 30% men. In addition, another telling piece of data from the Healer Within Foundation is the numbers of practice leaders who have chosen to affiliate themselves with the foundation and who have had an active practice, either leading group practice online or in person. Between the years of 2020 and 2023, 
there have been 77 unique practice groups. Of these, 52 were led by women and 25 were led by men who had either trained with the Healer Within Foundation or volunteered with the foundation. This is all great news. The amazing thing is that women are responding. A female audience was part of the original vision for the foundation. But it is also powerful to recognize that men come to the trainings and the practice groups. And the fact is that anyone who attends is likely to be led by a woman. That's the good news. What is not clear from these numbers is who goes on to pursue training and further education. This is the heart of the matter when it comes to the topic of women and Tai Chi. One of the core values the trainers, teachers, and practice leaders share is the value and the necessity of continuing education. This is true of anyone who is drawn to mind-body practice. When you make a deeper commitment to mind-body practice of any kind, you recognize that it involves your whole life and every aspect of your whole life, mind, body, and spirit. People who come to the trainings and seek education are lifelong learners. As we all know, there's always more to learn, always a bigger view to learn and embrace. To this end, Healer Within Foundation also offers courses and educational symposia that are open to the public, but these courses and symposia also serve as continuing education for the teachers and practice leaders that are trained at the Healer Within Foundation. The numbers of people who pursue these further education opportunities tell an interesting story. Not many women take advantage. The attendees of these symposia and continuing education classes are often a balance of men and women. There have been instances where a few individuals who have sought training and started off as practice leaders went on to get more training and train as teachers and even become teacher trainers, but it's a small number. So the reality is that the practice leaders, many of them women, once trained, do not go further. This is the heart of the matter, and it speaks to the issue of bringing women more fully into training and practice. This means two things. Greater numbers of women practicing in the first place and then training women with life skills that honor their experience as women. This is a great opportunity to make the education and training of women more pertinent to women, including a rich set of topics that may be considered specific to women's life experience. In a way, this becomes a special kind of space. It's true in health sciences and statistics is that when it comes to seeking wellness, it is women who seek wellness more than men. This is true of group health practices at gyms, for example. A very recent study on gender differences and exercise habits from the International Journal of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences in 2022 showed that the exercise itself can motivate men versus the reasons to exercise, which is what motivates women to participate in exercise. Reasons like improving the quality of life through weight loss or blood sugar control, can speak to women, whereas the men need to know the exercises themselves are enjoyable for them in order to do them. Men come to value the benefits of exercise after, not before. But when it comes to diving deep and seeking mastery and making mind-body practice central to life, everyone, especially women, can use more encouragement. Courses especially suited to women may be a good start. For example, courses and practices that support the various phases in a woman's life stages can be an especially appealing curriculum for women. For example, courses that address puberty, childbearing, menopause can bring women into practice for very practical and useful reasons. There's also a need for both women and men to recognize women as leaders and to have women in leadership roles. 
In this way, women can develop confidence in decision-making and being valued in community for not just the work they do, but for who they are as persons. An attitude of inviting women to see themselves as part of the world is helpful. Practice geared towards self-defense and spirituality can educate women about greater realities affecting society. This type of education helps women see themselves in society and in their families. This is not always an easy type of curriculum. There are harsh realities of social and economic inequities, misogyny, and objectification in society at large that affects women. Women and men in society need to reckon with these realities in a compassionate and empowering way. In many ways, this is why we practice Tai Chi. It's not because Tai Chi is the answer, but it goes a long way in making us the answer to these great issues in our lives. My body practice is suited to this and can create a sense of meaning in terms of artistic and health expression, service in society, and purpose in life. As women seek mastery and are encouraged to seek mastery, they can participate more fully in society. Mastery, after all, is about finding a way of moving in life that is joyful, victorious, and characterized by integrity and purpose. This is where the excitement is, and it may very well require a reimagining of what it means to share Tai Chi and Qigong practice. Women teachers is a great start. Thank you. But I'm going to start with Ruth. If you, Ruth, if you could design the ideal study in this area, what would it be? Don't think too much. Um, <laughs> I would probably start with the top, um, one of the top five leading causes of death in women and make sure that I had a study that um, was really reporting those results specific to women. Um, maybe have men and women and see whether we had differences between them in different outcomes, but make sure that you know we were measuring things that were important to women. Um, not only would I do like a randomized control trial, which is the classical standard, but maybe add interviews afterwards to get some more um, detail of, you know from them about the study. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, you have gone through very deep Tai Chi training. You're a lineage holder. And I'm wondering what kind of obstacles do women who are on your kind of path to mastery, what kind of obstacles do they face? And how can we support women uh, to strengthen their commitment to practice. Okay, well, um, as you mentioned, if you go the traditional route, like myself, <laughs> you have to spend a lot of time and uh, energy and money <laughs> to, uh, to go through that journey. And uh, I truly enjoy it and, uh, during the process, and I appreciate um, my family or my husband's support. Uh, I did not start uh, my uh, Tai Chi journey until I was 47. I was quite old. <laughs> and like a lot of uh, masters, they started at a young age. I was quite old. But uh, I enjoyed so much, I just kept going. And uh, at the same time, my children are growing up. Uh, I don't have, uh, I did not have that much uh, family responsibilities anymore. Yes, I still had a day job. And uh, so it requires a lot of determination and um, a lot of sacrifices. And then, and also, you know, you have to get understanding from your family. Um, I think in uh, this society, it is still difficult and, uh, uh, for women to get that kind of uh, uh, privilege. And uh, I travel all over. I travel to China so many times. And um, in the beginning, I travel to my teacher's home in LA. And um, so, yeah, and that requires that. And also, because of traditional um, Tai Chi Chuan, as I mentioned, is martial art as well as 
killing her. And some of the women are not interested in martial art as much as I do. And uh, not say I'm going to do a street fight, but I want to know not just how to do it, I want to know why. And uh, so it, it, it is part of my interest. <laughs> Maybe I'm a tomboy. <laughs> okay. Uh, so one of the recommendations here is, is spirituality. And I know we have had a little bit of dialogue around this about how um, a lot of women are interested in these practices because of the spiritual dimension. And I'm, I'm wondering what you think about how training programs can address that particular need. And you know, we haven't heard any talk about that here at this conference. So what, what do you think? Thank you for the question, Sharon. I think spirituality is, is the, the thing that is like a synonym for whole person health. Mm -hmm. If we start to really invite the whole person, we're inviting the whole life. So if we start to translate, what does that mean, the whole, whole person? We can speak to women in terms of what is happening in their lives and what is unsatisfactory and what needs to be changed. And a lot needs to be changed, right, and just in society, but also in women's lives. Women's lives are really, really challenging. You know, the heart, the cardio, the heart attacks, right? I mean, women, that's a kind of a surprise, but that's what women are dealing with. That's the kind of pressure women are under so if we say, this is for your whole life, that becomes, if that message could sink in, that's the way I would start. And in fact, that is what brought me here. This is about my whole life. This is about service. This is about art. This is about other people. This is about being your whole self, you know, whether you are a an artist or whether you are a, you know, somebody who really wants to understand the body and push it to its limits and do the martial side of these practices as well. So if we think about that spirituality is kind of a type of freedom and a type of a way of looking at your whole life, that becomes a way to speak to women and to invite the, the spiritual in, with perhaps not even using the word. Thank you. Thank you. Making classes trauma informed has been extremely important. And uh, the Healer Within Foundation actually has a class that's called Teaching uh, Qigong in a Trauma Informed Way. And that's actually been informed by the students and what do students need. And what can happen in a self defense class or a martial arts class, I've, I've actually lived this, so this is personal, okay, is that those students, women, learning, to defend themselves can start to bump into those issues of why they need to defend themselves and why are they not safe walking down the street alone. And so they can be in touch with those horrors of society and then, you know, then the tears come and then, you know, it's just, oh my, thank goodness, it's a six week class. Because by the end, the women are powerful. The women are, yes, I can do this and I, I, I have something that can protect myself and other women, I can actually stand up for myself. So that question about um, what are the advantages, it's like letting, you know, really finding your way to navigate through those inequities in society, those horrors of society, in, in a way with confidence, you know, with confidence, and, and also to have that a sisterhood, right? You know, there's other people who know this and can share it. So, um I wanted to throw this slide up at the end to show you some female masters in this in the United States of ours. And I want to particularly point out Marilyn Cooper here. You know, today we saw a discharge from a guy to another guy. We saw it twice. We saw Peter and then we saw the film. And a lot of times you can say, oh, that's that's muscle, that's, you know, it's easy to look at two guys doing that and say, it's muscular. But when you see a woman do it, 
a little woman, lovely little woman, by the way, my friend, uh, you can see that it's energy. And so I think that women, when you talk about an advantage, there is something about that connection to energy. Thank you all for being here and for doing the work that you're doing and for persevering, you know, what Josie said, persevere, you know. I mean, I love men. I have had many men teachers who I adore, but, you know, step up. We have a lot to offer. So uh, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, Immortal Sisters of the Dow, you can find me there and DowSharon.com. And I want to thank these wonderful